Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Mercer County in Pennsylvania, two Boy Scouts were hiding in the woods playing capture the flag. While they were hiding in some brush, they accidentally disturbed a Bigfoot, which then rambled out of the brush at an amazing rate of speed. It was bipedal and huge. The friend said that he was scared to death as they made a promise to never tell anyone about it. The creature was seven to eight feet tall and blackish brown to red in color. The hair hung Irish setter-like, but equal in length all over to the body. The arms were proportionally longer than a human's arms. The shoulders were only two and a half feet wide. There had been other sightings in the same area. On to the next one. At Laurel Hill, above the abandoned Laurel Hill Turnpike Tunnel, the witness was returning from a grassy field of an older road and had the feeling that they were being watched. He also noticed the strong smell of what can be described as a cross between body odor and a wet dog. He was facing upwind of the smell when he noticed something out of the corner of his eye moving parallel to the old road. He could not get a look at it, but he could see that it was huge and bigger than a bear and moving much faster than one. It was also not shy about making noise as it moved through the dense woods. The witness fled the scene. The witness had been hunting ground hog and squirrel with a twenty two rifle. On to the next one. Mr. Edward Kramer and his girlfriend saw a strange creature that was six and a half feet tall and covered with fur. This was in East Pennsboro in Cumberland County in Pennsylvania. The head seemed to sit on its shoulders, and it had no neck. It had no snout, unlike a bear. It also had extremely long arms, and though it looked like an ape, it walked like a man. This was an unusual Bigfoot. Kramer gave a loud shout, and the creature ignored him. Kramer's cousin was also on the property when the creature walked within eight feet of him. This was near the area where the property owners had dumped some chicken entrails after butchering. The smell was so bad that it made him sick. The humanoid ran off as the witness shouted. A motorist also saw the same creature and got to eight feet from it as he drove by. The witness also stated that the creature had no neck, was six foot six inches tall, and covered in hair. The Bigfoot bared its long fangs at the driver. It also had large claws. In the following few days, a similar creature was seen throughout the area. It was also spotted at the local waterworks about five miles away. Kramer stated that he again encountered similar beasts, including a large female and a smaller juvenile, and they walked in front of his car. The larger one was seven feet tall and covered with charcoal-colored fur. On another occasion, Kramer thought that he saw a prowler on his girlfriend's parents' property and ran to the porch and then paused when he realized that it was another one of the creatures. When it stepped in front of a white fence about 50 feet away, he saw it clearly. It had a long stride and wide, slouchy shoulders. Around the same time, a couple from Michigan reported seeing a beast cross the highway in front of their car. On to the next one. Rex and I had done this hike numerous times during different months of the year, each providing us with a different set of challenges. In particular, during the winter, the snow near the summit can be waist deep. Regardless of that, during any winter or even late spring hikes, you will most definitely need walking poles and spikes. This is an extremely difficult hike in anyone's book, 
and I'm sure many people turn back after having begun it. The left side of the trail can be quite treacherous, presenting you with many switchbacks and some very steep inclines, where you are more mountain climbing than hiking. From Hoodsport, you head west nine miles on Lake Cushman Road until you reach Fourth Service Road number 24. Turning left, you proceed three miles until you see the trailhead sign on your right. There are several things I will caution your listeners about. During this hike, you are virtually enclosed in the forest the entire time, and on many occasions, after you reach the summit, you find that you are encased in fog, obscuring all of your view. From the top, you can see Mount Rainier, Adams, and St. Helen further off in the distance. You are looking at the Olympics, and below you is Lake Cushman, which is breathtaking in and of itself. There are also times of the year when the yellow jackets are swarming. There are so many of them that you can loudly hear them as you are approaching, and they will attack you. Now that I have thoroughly discouraged you, let me say that when conditions go right, this hike is one for the book, well worth the effort. Although it is touted to be some 5.5 miles in length on my GPS, I have it clocked at more or less 7.5 miles. I would also advise anyone to bring twice as much water as they think they will need. And if you have soft feet, bring band-aids as well. The last time that Billy and I were in here, we hiked up on a cougar that was less than 10 feet from the trail, and it took off like a rocket. This time around, we were planning to do our second night hike. There are absolutely no words to describe sitting at the summit at 4 a.m. under the canopy of the night sky. I actually pity humanity for not experiencing such beauty in their lifetime. Rex and I were getting set to go, and it was about 1.15 a.m. when we began the hike. It was late July, and the night was pristine to say the least. Being well familiar with this trail, we had made it to the summit in about two and a half hours. I must warn you, also, that the hike begins at about 700 feet of elevation, and at the peak, you are at about 4,300 feet. I only say that because this hike is steep and arduous the entire time that you are in it. Having achieved the summit, we laid back on our packs, enveloped by the night sky. As I was laying there, I felt as though the sky was drawing me into itself, and I was thinking that I was at one with the universe. Mere words cannot describe what we were feeling at the time. After about 90 minutes or so, we began our descent down the right-hand side of the mountain. This side is somewhat easier than the left. And of course, we were now going downhill as well. I must say that for those of you who are not night owls, your eyes actually do get quite accustomed to the dark, and you can see reasonably well, all things considered. On this trail, you are literally in the trees the entire time, with only a few occasional breaks overlooking the slope and some well-dispersed living and dead timber. It was during one of these breaks that I was certain I had seen something large and dark move quickly across a small clearing on the slope. The area it had moved across was maybe 30 or 40 feet away top, and it was very tall and large. We conversed briefly, kicking around as to what it could have been, and continued our hike. A few minutes later, both of us heard what was clearly some rocks and debris tumbling down the same slope to our right. Now, understand me, please. When you are in these conditions, hiking in the dark, your senses are most certainly heightened, and we began to feel like we were being stalked 
and maybe watched, and we were far from reaching the bottom. The difficulty became keeping our focus on the trail and our footing in the dark while still being acutely aware that something was definitely flanking our movement on the slope. We kept walking, all the while still hearing noises which were becoming increasingly unnerving to the two of us. At this point in time, we were not keeping silent and were actually shouting things like, go away, and trying to scare off whatever this was. We had just passed through a switchback that opens up into about a 150-foot somewhat straight run of a trail ahead of us when we both came to a sudden halt ahead of us. Maybe 75 feet away was a glaring pair of bright red eyes peering directly at us in the darkness. These eyes were set very widely apart and were more than 10 feet from the ground. In the moment, I felt that they were almost having a hypnotic effect on me, but I tried to focus on the rest of the image that was before us. Even in the darkness, I could make out a clear outline of something of enormous stature that was rocking from side to side. As we were standing there, looking at these eyes, Billy was standing slightly behind me on the trail. He bent down to grab a large rock and hurled it at this thing, hitting it squarely as he shouted, Get the heck out of here! Well, when I tell you that all heck broke loose, that would be an understatement. This thing let out a screaming roar that words can't describe. I thought it would knock us down, and it was deafening to our ears. The two of us turned simultaneously to run back up the trail. I don't think we were 30 feet into our retreat when I heard Rex let out a scream. I turned, and Rex was now on his back, laying on the ground, groaning, as this beast was now standing over him, screaming with its mouth wide open and contorting its upper body. I was now maybe ten feet away from an enormous roaring Bigfoot standing over my best friend. In the heat of the moment, I guess I did what anyone would have done. I took one of my walking sticks, which were nothing more than winter ski poles with the rings removed, and I flung it at the beast sidearm like a whirling sword. God was with us that day because it hit him squarely in the face. I believe it hit him right in the eye. I say that because the beast immediately put both of its hands to its face and started screaming and staggering around on the trail. I now had Rex on the ground reeling in pain and Bigfoot staggering around screaming. I don't think it was 10 seconds later that the Bigfoot while holding its hands to its face, lost its footing on the edge of the trail and fell off the side, tumbling down the slope. I knew I had to move and move quickly, so I ran to Rex. As I tried to grab him, he said that his shoulder was broken. He couldn't move his arm, and he was in obvious pain. I told him, Brother, you have to get up or this thing will kill us. We have got to move now. I pulled his pack off, got him to his feet, and we started moving downward. Rex was writhing in pain, but he was moving, and this Bigfoot was screaming and howling on the side of the slope behind us. I think a combination of adrenaline and fear had taken over Rex, because he was now moving quickly with my help. For some 15 minutes, we could still hear this beast groaning and screaming behind us. In the moment, I could only think about David slaying Goliath in the biblical narrative with one smooth stone. Eventually, the sound of the beast were gone, and we covered a considerable distance. We reached a point where we could see that the sun was beginning to rise, and all I could think of was that we were now safe. It's funny now, but in my mind, I actually thought of Dracula not being able to stand sunlight, and I was thinking the same about the Bigfoot. All that Billy has been telling you is exactly as it happened. We were now nearing the trailhead, 
and the safety of our vehicle. When we finally got into the car, another vehicle was pulling over to begin the day's hike. When they saw us and the condition that I was in, they asked us what had happened. I needed medical attention, so we wasted no time. We told them that we had been attacked by a Bigfoot that was still up there somewhere and that we had hit him in the eye with a ski pole and ran. Their jaws dropped so far that they hit the ground. We jumped in the car and took off, and we could see them do the same. When we made it to the hospital, the doctor asked us what happened, and you can imagine what that led to. After some x-rays were taken, we found that Rex had a fractured clavicle, which although was quite painful, was not as bad as it could have been. And after a sling was applied, he was feeling a lot better. This all happened quite a few years ago, but when we were in the hospital, Rex told me that as soon as we had started to attempt running back up the trail, this creature had grabbed his backpack, slamming him to the rocky ground on his back. He knew immediately that something had broken in his body. Rex said that his body was shaking as this thing stood over him, roaring down at him. This was obviously retribution for being hit with the rock. And who knows, it may have killed both of us right there and then. Even in the darkness, when we were finally all in close quarters, I could see the immensity of this beast. I thought I would collapse from fear alone right on the spot, but something welled up from within me and I hurled the ski pole. I guess it was an all or nothing, all fight or flight response. And to be honest with you, I believe there was some divine intervention working for me with that ski pole flight that night because I firmly believe the pointed end went right into its eye. The way this thing was staggering and screaming, falling off the side of the slope, he had to have had his eye knocked out. When I was on the ground and I looked up, seeing this thing leaning over me, I cannot tell you how frightened I was. Billy saved our lives that day, I'm sure. If it wasn't for his quick thinking and reaction, I believe it would have killed us or maimed us. I was 15 feet away from it when I let the pole fly, and it had to be 12 feet tall and as wide as a barn door. The sound of its roar actually made the skin on my face vibrate. It had to have weighed well over a thousand pounds or more. We have never gone back there again and wonder every day about those who do. On to the next one. My encounter with Bigfoot happened only a few years ago in a small town in Idaho while I was walking home from my U.S. History summer school class. There really aren't too many details to the story, but I've become secretly obsessed with the topic of Bigfoot ever since the day it happened. I was walking along a bike path that I always used to walk home, whenever the weather was pleasant. I was looking down at my phone, scrolling through social media, when suddenly this large figure walked across the path in front of me. It was so startling. I dropped my phone and the screen shattered. But for obvious reasons, that was the least of my concerns at the moment in time. It moved pretty quickly across the bike path, and from what I saw of it, the first time around, it didn't appear to be looking at me or concerned by my presence. Initially, I was terrified that it was a grizzly bear. There was nobody else on the bike path at the time, and the idea of being alone with the grizzly shakes me to my core. I've read numerous reports where people claim that the fear from seeing a Sasquatch is as intense as it gets. I can't say why, but I didn't get that feeling as I looked at it more closely. I was definitely shocked, but I wouldn't say I was overly frightened or paralyzed with fear like you sometimes hear about. I continued to stand there for a while, peering into the part of the forest that it had just entered, hoping to get another glimpse so that I could confirm I wasn't losing my mind. I guess I got lucky, 
because the Sasquatch came hobbling out on two legs and crossed back over to the other side. This time, it was carrying what looked like some large shrubbery in its left hand. The Sasquatch just stared at me. It didn't look like it had any malicious intentions whatsoever, but it was rather just as curious as I was. We looked back and forth at one another for what had to be around 10 seconds before it just wandered off. After I regained some composure, I picked up my broken phone and continued along the bike path. It was as I was walking past the patch of wood where the Sasquatch disappeared that my nostrils were overwhelmed with a foul odor. I found it so interesting how the scent continued to linger even after the Sasquatch was presumably a good distance away. I did tell some of my closest friends about what had happened that day, but I've never gotten the impression that they completely believe me, and it's not as if I blame them for that. I know it would be a tough sell if I hadn't seen it with my own two eyes. I did initially mistake it for a grizzly, and that's because of the color of its fur or hair, which was so comparable to the brown shade that you typically see on a bear. The way it moved across the bike path reminded me a lot of how other large primates, such as gorillas or orangutans, walk when they're bipedal. However, its steps seemed to be much quieter, almost muted. I suppose this would make sense as I believe these creatures are around us much more frequently than we imagine, but they're also the most stealthy species on the face of this earth. I mean, wouldn't they have to be to remain undetected for this long? Anyhow, although the face reminded me of a primate, it was unlike any primate I've ever seen. It did have a conical head, and the face had this almost droopy appearance to it. I think its traits helped immensely in making it look less threatening, since it was hunched over and hobbling. I'm unable to determine how tall it could have been, but I'll go ahead and guess that it was somewhere between six and a half to seven feet. I definitely saw why so many people say they look like bodybuilders. Its muscle definition was unrivaled, even underneath all of the hair. The neck appeared to be virtually non-existent, and when it looked my way, it seemed to rotate its torso in unison with its head. One of the main things that stuck out to me was the size of its hands. The palms looked larger than baseball gloves, and the fingers longer than bananas. It could easily wrap one hand around an adult human head. Just from looking at this thing, there was no question that it had to be among the most powerful organisms on this planet. On to the next one. My husband and I were searching through great granddad Charles Gable's old diaries. He passed away back in 1946, and his diaries were so interesting that some of them were on display in the old Kirbyville house for a long time and then handed down to us. We saw these references to ape men and thought you might be interested. Charlie was a sort of postmaster for a while, and we were told that he knew more than most people about the Illinois Valley, and many people would go to him for asking and reporting what was happening in the county. Not like a town gossip, more like the central information recorder, I guess. Anyway, the old articles appear in the Argus newspaper, which soon became the Courier. Granddad seemed to have a deep interest in the ape men reports, and the one we're sending you were in a separate binder. He kept sort of a diary of these events. June 1911. J.C. Matheson in the Oreo mine in Galice said two of his men on the late shift reported a big ape-like beast pushing rock down the slope as they came off shift. One big one hit Tom Rockwell's thermos and smashed it. The foreman just told them to forget it and not to say anything. Or bringing $210 a ton, so making hay on both ships. 
August 1914. Thaler Diggings J. Hawker Williams said he worked at Thaler Diggings Waldo, and back in them days, they had a giant two-legged critter stealing food from the cook shack. Said it must have been nine feet tall. Nobody ever shot it, but he said it got scared off. July 1915. Reported sighting of an eight-foot-tall forest critter with light black hair, but walked on two legs with senior town. August 15, 1920. Phil Haldsworth reported seeing one of the giant ape critters up on B-level of the Almeida Mine. This is the fourth miner to see one. It didn't do anything but watch him go to work. Phil said it was huge, but he was running late, so he hurried by. Said he would have anyway, big as it was. They're finding copper, silver, lead, and gold in the Almeida on all three levels. No date, just a notation. The owner of the Golden Bug Mine, the Roaming, and Annie Neal hired Tom Mathers to sit guard at the mine site for a shot at the ape man if he comes back. He's been going into the supply shed and stealing potatoes and whatever else can be eaten. On to the next one. I was living on the outskirts of Greensboro, North Carolina. I had three dogs living with me at the time. One black Labrador, one yellow Labrador, and one German Shepherd mix, all of which were females. The trio of dogs was excellent for the wooded environment that I resided in at the time. They were extremely intelligent and in touch with the natural habitat. None of them was the type to bark for no reason. When they did sound the alarm, it was always because predators were nearby. Let me tell you, nothing intimidated them. At least, that's what I once thought. I had been living in that home for over two years when I was mysteriously woken up by all my dogs whimpering at once. All three of them slept near the foot of my bed, and the behavior was so unusual that I remember questioning whether I was in a dream state. The German shepherd, Blair, was doing circles near my bedroom door. It was hard to tell if she wanted to investigate something or if she wanted to escape the bedroom for whatever reason. I tried to hush them for quite some time without any success. None of them were looking toward either of my bedroom windows, so it was more like they had smelled something or heard something my senses didn't pick up on. Eventually, I became so restless that I let Blair walk out of the room, hoping to get some clues as to what had stirred them up. My other dogs, Greta and Mama, stayed put in the room, continuing their soft whimpers. I grabbed a glass of water while I watched Blair trot in circles around my living room coffee table. I did notice that she was occasionally glancing up toward the windows, but it was apparent that she couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. After a few minutes of watching the same thing, I asked Blair back into my bedroom and allowed the three dogs to jump up on the bed with me. That was something I so rarely did, but I couldn't think of anything else to get them to calm down. There was something about the four of us being huddled together that helped them to calm down. For the next couple of weeks, everything in life proceeded as normal. It got to the point where I was able to brush off that strange behavior. I guess I just convinced myself that one of them was overreacting and it caused the others to become concerned for no reason. Then I woke up to the same thing. This time, the trio seemed even more worked up than the last time. I'm one of those folks who are woken up very easily and find it very challenging to fall back asleep. Unfortunately, this pattern turned into a regular thing that after that second incident, without any indication as to what was getting the dog so worked up. Even though I didn't have much money to spend on that sort of thing, I brought the three of them to be examined by the vet. I was starting to come to a variety of strange theories, one of them being that I might have a terminal illness 
and they could somehow smell it. You hear about all sorts of weird things like that, so I became very open-minded about what was bothering them so much. After the vet ran tests on all three of my dogs and couldn't find anything wrong with them, I decided to see my physician for the first time in years. I just wanted to squash those worries. My doctor would end up revealing to me that I was pretty much as healthy as one could get at the age of 44. Even though I was relieved to learn that we were all physically okay, it didn't solve the nighttime routine. It had gotten so bad that I was losing hours of sleep almost every night. It was badly affecting my schedule, and I wasn't getting nearly as much work done on the job. I had searched my yard multiple times without finding any evidence of intruders or rare animals. But there was one day when I came home from work at lunchtime to make a sandwich, and I noticed a few very strange-looking tracks in the dirt by my driveway. The only conclusion that could come to me at the time was that the tracks belonged to some large wolf, but the toes were much longer than any wild dog I knew to exist. Additionally, I knew my dogs wouldn't have been intimidated by a rogue wolf. Together, the three of them were confident that they could take on any intrusive wild animal. It was that same night that my dogs woke me up yet again. Even though I was weirded out by the tracks that I found earlier that day, I just couldn't take it anymore. I went outside with a flashlight and my dogs were essentially screaming. It was as if they were begging me to come back inside. When I closed the door behind me, I could hear them whimpering louder than ever before. They were super concerned about my well-being. I started pointing the flashlight near the tree scanning the area for any movement. I remember how everything felt at that moment. It was as if time itself had stopped. As I neared the edge of the tree, my heart started to beat extremely fast, and I was overcome by this feeling that I shouldn't be out there. My instincts were telling me that I should have listened to my dog. It was as I was turning around, about to head back inside, that the shine from my flashlight landed on a figure that was more than halfway cloaked by the hanging pine tree. But I could see enough to know that it was looking directly at me. Suddenly, I caught sight of this massive head as it steadily ducked beneath the branch. The thing was standing on two legs, but from what I could see of the head, it reminded me so much of my own German shepherd only much larger, and its face was considerably wider. The creature was multiple shades of dark brown and black and was completely covered with fur. The branch which it lowered its head below was considerably high, making it as clear as day that this thing was no shorty. I don't think it was standing up straight, but I'm not going to throw it out there that I think it was around eight feet tall. I could see one of the hands, and I say hands because it didn't look like a paw. I could see a long, opposable thumb. All of the fingers had long nails extended from them. I wanted to turn and run from this thing, but there was no question that it would be able to tackle me before I could get to my door. It truly felt as though I was at this thing's mercy. I had been so devastated by the sight of this creature that I hadn't even noticed. My dogs were now barking louder than ever and clawing at my front door. I think it's because they wanted to protect me and were very aware of what stood only yards away from me. The creature continued to hunch its head beneath the branch and then bring it back up. It would change this position every few seconds while keeping the rest of its body completely still. I'm not even totally sure that it knew I could see it while it stood behind that tree. Then a slight sigh of relief came over me as I watched the creature swiftly turn and head back into the woods. As soon as I could no longer see it, that's when I did a 180 
and sprinted toward my front door. It felt as though I was running in slow motion, like I could not get inside fast enough. Thankfully, I made it to the door and slammed it closed behind me. When I walked over to the window to close the blind, that's when I came face to face with the creature. It was standing inches away from the glass, its shoulders hunched so that its head was level with mine. You're going to think this sounds insane, but those eyes were purely human. It is because of this experience that I now do not doubt that werewolves, lichens, or however you want to refer to them, are as real as ever. It didn't take long for me to realize that all three of my dogs had left the room. I guess seeing the creature that up close crossed the line, and they were too intimidated to let out another peep, even if it was to warn me, their master. I always wonder what my dogs thought of the creature. Do they know the truth about what it was? Did they see it as some demonic entity or just another animal that happens to be much more powerful? If my theory is correct, could they tell that the creature had human DNA? That is something that has always intrigued me. There is no question that dogs possess senses that are superior to ours, so I badly wish I could have asked my dogs for their analysis of the creature that visited us that night. I remember how the creature's breath quickly began fogging up the glasses. It was amazing to me how I never heard it take a single step while it moved toward the house. Maybe I was just too scared to pay attention at the time, but if these creatures are as stealthy as ninjas, that makes their existence all the more terrifying. It continued to stare at me as I slowly backed away from the window. I backed around the corner and into the kitchen, grabbed the largest butcher knife I had, waited a few minutes, then peeked around the corner. I could see nothing through the window. I'm not sure how long I waited, but I stood there, leaning against the counter, pretty much waiting for any sign of noise. All is silent. Eventually, my dog trotted out from hiding, and I took that as a sign that the creature had vacated the area. My dog and I stayed up for the remainder of the night, and we went and got a motel room the following night. I ended up renting an apartment on a month-to-month -month basis, and I realized I was too frightened to stay another night at my house. I ended up selling the house to a burly fellow who was really into deer hunting. I assumed he had seen some weird things in the woods, so I didn't hesitate to tell him about my encounter. He claimed he had never seen anything that unusual. However, he had heard so many strange noises that he couldn't match with any known animal. My story didn't deter him from making the purchase. If anything, it seemed to excite him and might have even persuaded him to seal the deal. I always told myself I was going to follow up with the purchaser as to whether he had seen the werewolf-like creature, but I never got around to it. I eventually sent a letter to my old address not too many years ago, simply asking if the fellow still lived there, but I never received a response, so I never took it any further. I don't know I'll ever know for sure what I encountered while living at my old property, but what I do know for sure is that there are so many truths out there that are beyond our wildest imagination. On to the next one. Sky Ambrose was a middle-aged massage therapist in St. Louis, Missouri. Her life consisted of her work and her family, and she had no interest whatsoever in the topic of UFOs or aliens. But that would change on the night of November 6, 1989. Sky was driving to a massage therapy conference in Aspen, Colorado, accompanied by a colleague called Jennifer. It had been a long but uneventful trip when they stopped at a service station in Flagler, Colorado, just before midnight. After they gassed up, they were planning to find a motel and turn in for the night. But shortly after they left the gas station, they both noticed a bright object shining down from above 
just a short distance away. Both the road and the skies were empty, except for this one lone light. It might have been a bright star or planet, but as sky continued down the road, the object loomed larger and became more defined. Soon, they could make out subtle movement and flashing colored light that circled the object. They also saw smaller green light emerging from the larger light. What on earth or off it was this? Fascinated, Sky and Jennifer pulled to the side of the road and dimmed all their lights so they could get a better view. They watched the objects dance around in the sky for the better part of an hour. At one point, Guy took a look at the digital clock on her car's dash and saw that it was 12.40 a.m. Shortly afterward, a brilliant lit ball of light dropped down to the right and began hovering over a dark field a short distance from where they had parked. Underneath the illuminated object, the women could make out a solid, cone-shaped structure which emitted beams of pastel, pink, blue, and lavender light. It seemed to be searching the ground below, but searching for what? Guy and Jennifer looked at each other and asked in unison, Do you see the same thing I'm seeing? They both felt a strange and excited expectation, as if something wonderful was about to happen. But, as if someone had suddenly fast-forwarded the tape, the next thing they knew, they were driving down the empty road again, and the craft was gone, as if it had never been there in the first place. They realized immediately that something wasn't right. They felt as if a whole sequence of events had somehow been deleted from their mind, and their earlier excitement had been instantaneously replaced with a feeling of exhaustion irritability, and preference for silence and solitude. When they finally made it to a motel, it was 2.30 a.m. What had seemed like a few minutes on the road had somehow turned into nearly two hours. Skye and Jennifer felt more and more out of sorts the longer they thought about what must have happened to them. They were both exhausted. Skye noted that Jennifer seemed red and flushed and Jennifer thought that Guy was unusually pale, like death warmed over. They were even more bewildered the next day when they got back in the car and saw that the fuel gauge certainly did not match the amount of time they would have been driving if they had really been out on the road until 2.30 in the morning. What was going on? The strange inconsistencies of that night bothered both women so much that they made a pact to get to the bottom of it. Their breakthrough occurred when Skye mentioned the sighting and the missing time episode to a friend of hers who happened to be in contact with folks at the mutual UFO network MUFON. This group directed them to a Missouri-based hypnotherapist named John Carpenter who specialized in conducting hypnotic regression to retrieve lost memories. The fact that two people had witnessed the same event was an exciting prospect for Dr. Carpenter, as if he interviewed them separately and their stories matched, he could be reasonably sure that they were telling the truth. He conducted the session on November 12, 1989, just five days after the event. With the tape recorder rolling, Dr. Carpenter put Guy into a hypnotic state and began to ask her questions about her experience. She was then able to break through whatever mental block was in place and report what had happened after they pulled over to watch the flashing UFO. According to Sky, two extraterrestrials came up to the vehicle and mentally instructed her to stop the engine while simultaneously assuring her that everything was going to be all right. The next thing she knew she and Jennifer were both being levitated out of the car in sitting position, apparently by passing them right through the roof. There are many abductee accounts of aliens being able to pass human beings through solid objects, and they just kept going up and up. 
The car is way down there. It's really small. The more I look at it, the tinier it gets. It looks like I'm seeing the, from, uh, like in the sky. It's like we don't weigh much. It's more like we're floating. Later, in a separate interview, Jennifer recalls the exact same phenomenon. I seem to see the car from outside. I'm behind it, looking down at an angle above the right side of the roof. I'm higher than just a little bit ago. I see a pinhead of where the car was. It's real tiny now. Guy and Jennifer both recount that they were pulled up into the ship and deposited into a small round room with geometrically shaped windows and a reddish glow. They had been pulled up through the solid metal roof of Sky's car and then through the solid metal hull of a spacecraft. From other accounts, it seems that alien vessels can hit individuals with beams of energy that encapsulate them, pick them up, and then somehow shakes up the very molecules of their bodies to render them able to pass through solid objects. Abductees feel an incredible vibration as their molecules are spaced out far enough to make them permeable to other matter. Once they're on board, they are made solid again while floating an inch or two above the floor and gently set down in whatever section of the ship the ETs desire. Interestingly, some abductees have reported that this dematerialization process is enabled by a computer chip previously implanted into the victim's body. According to this theory, when the beam hits the individual, the chip activates and alters the person's molecular structure to allow him to pass through solid objects. If this is the case, it would mean that Guy and Jennifer must also have been abducted when they were much younger, had the chips implanted, and forgotten all about it. Sky, in fact, did later come to believe that she had been an abductee ever since she was a child, and had just never realized it. At any rate, when Sky and Jennifer were transported into the craft, they had a room with a view. Glancing out the window, they could see something typically reserved for astronauts. The Earth shimmering against the void in all of its majestic wonder. In Sky's words, I can see, looking out one of the windows, a bluish, like, link blue globe of some sort outside the window, like pictures you might see of planets. It's not a picture, a deep blue. It looks bluish. It's real pretty. As nice as this moment may have been, what happened next would not be nearly so enjoyable. Some aliens came into the room to greet their startled guests and then led them to a large room where they began to examine them. Sky and Jennifer were placed on cold steel tables as various medical devices went into motion, running tests and taking samples from them. The room was set up like a big auditorium, and sure enough, up in the balcony were several aliens watching the examination take place. It was similar to an operating amphitheater, such as one might see at a medical school. Only this one, apparently, had a bunch of alien med students watching and taking notes. Jennifer described it like this. The room is kind of an auditorium, like oval-shaped seats that go, oh, six or eight levels, and they all look alike. The beings conducting the exam were communicating telepathically, telling the women not to be afraid, attempting to calm them down. It's as if they were assuring us, we should not be afraid. They're not going to hurt us. Guy seconded this, similarly reporting, they seem to be communicating, that they mean us no harm. I don't think they talked, but I know they're communicating. They don't say anything. It's not coming out of their mouth. I don't know if they even have a mouth but I feel them communicating. The idea that the so-called gray aliens communicate through mental telepathy is, of course, another common theme in UFO lore. Abductees have reported hearing distinct words and phrases in their mind or at other times, simply strong impressions or feelings that seem to be projected toward them. 
more unusually, Guy and Jennifer's captors also used touch to convey their message. Jennifer related that they came over and patted my hand. They made me feel comfortable. I feel warmth going into my hand. While Sky recalled, they tried to calm me. Somebody keeps rubbing my head with those hands. They passed this hand over Jennifer's forehead area, which seemed to either calm her or sedate her. After getting Jennifer to relax, the beings hooked up some kind of electrode to her hand, which were attached to complex computer-like panels with blinking light. Sky then observed them implanting some sort of tiny chip up Jennifer's nose. She's real quiet. She's not moving. I don't know if they used some sort of anesthesia, but it's some kind of operation. They have some type of implant thing, but it is in the left side of her nose. I think it's some type of operation. She's been having her nose bleeding. When they are finished, they help her sit up. She's coughing or bleeding or something. After this unpleasant experience, Jennifer demanded to know, what are you doing to me? The beings obligingly explained that they need to have more information about what my chemistry is all about. Something was being energized through my system. When they were taking all these tests, taking information from me, from my body chemistry, Guy meanwhile stated that they're working for the advancement. Something about genetic coding within beings. Many beings have a particular genetic coding that allow for our cooperation in what they're doing. After the strange examination ended, Skye and Jennifer were taken back to the room they had first arrived in. After another glance out the window to see the earth below them, they were transported back down to the planet on a beam of light. Jennifer recalled, it's as if we were just kind of descending. We're floating through the sky, then gently come down to Earth. Guy seconded this with a little more detail. One of the aliens does something with its hand, and we seem to be on our way back to the car. Once they got there, Sky said, a couple of ETs that had beamed down with them did another hand wave and rendered them with amnesia. They are seeing that we get in the car, they put their hand over our forehead, and we don't remember. Sky, in particular, was greatly affected by this revelation. Prior to it, she had never given the concept of UFOs or aliens a second thought. UFOs were not in my consciousness. It's not that I was a complete skeptic. It's just that. It was nothing that ever interested me. I wasn't into UFOs. So, when people are skeptical of the UFO phenomena, I understand. Guy's personal UFO saga was famously related by John Carpenter at the 1992 Abduction Study Conference at MIT, which was itself fully documented in the CDB Bryan book, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind. During the presentation, Guy was presented under the pseudonym of Susan, but she has since decided to embrace her experience with extraterrestrial entities and come forward with her story under her own name. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!